This press conference on the reskilling revolution, better skills for a billion people by 2030. So almost as twice as many jobs can be created than lost by the fourth industrial revolution. The jobs that are under threat are the jobs that are easily automated and, me and mechanized. So if we look at numbers are out, 30.1% unemployment rate. Just your reaction to that and an indication of how many jobs are set to be lost um, in the coming year because of the coronavirus and more. My name is Natasha, and welcome to Izuelami. Hi, and my name is Kumo. Thank you for joining us again. Awesome. Um, in today's segment of social distancing, we are joined by Carol Hondonga. Carol Hondonga is a global human capital strategist with diverse experience leading and delivering transformational high impact outcomes um, for multinational organizations within various sectors. Thank you so much for joining us, Carol. My pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. So, so Carol, just for the purpose of, of this conversation, before we, we get into the juicy and yummy parts, what, do you, what does a global human capital strategist actually do? So essentially, one is working at a strategic level, uh, balancing that again with some tactical execution. And what that involves is understanding the strategy of an organization and then designing and implementing the appropriate you know human capital um, intervention to enable the company to meet its strategy okay so, sounds exciting and challenging mm -hmm. um so so carol i think just to set the scene um you know we are now living in COVID 19 times and with that, so many governments have had to put in certain measures to try and curb and like flatten the curve, et cetera. And businesses have had to close for certain periods. And, you know, people were, have been changing the way that they operate as well as businesses. And if we're just looking at the current state of employment today, we just a few days ago, there was an announcement to say that you know, um, quarter one employment results came out and we're looking at about 30% um, unemployment rate. And if we're looking at the expanded definition, that number is initially is looking at about 39%. And then within that pool, um, a significant amount of it um, is belongs to the youth sitting at about 63%. So just in your area of expertise, if you could just tell us what the true um, trends are when it comes to employment and unemployment in South Africa right now? Mm -hmm. So definitely you are correct. Um, the unemployment rate has increased significantly. And um, what that has meant is that, you know, some, uh, we know a lot of sectors have actually been decimated. Absolutely. So for example, if you look at aviation, if you look at tourism, if you look at um, retail, you know, with the shutdowns that were in place, pretty much employees were at home. And some of these institutions um, within those sectors probably had some legacy uh, business challenges that have not been able um, to survive this pandemic. So you will see that, you know, quite a number of companies are going into administration, into liquidation. Um, and that's also exacerbated by um, reduced consumer spending, right, attributed mm -hmm. to the higher unemployment rate. So that's what we're seeing in the market. And um, especially, again, you know, for an economy, there's less trade, you know, as borders are closed. And even intra-country, intra there is no travel uh, or business that can happen across the provinces. So that's a situation that's prevailing now, again, with reduced business, this is where now, you know, organizations have asked employees to, you know, stay at home. Um, there have been redundancies. Um, you see an increase in other, you know, work, working options like, you know, taking unpaid sabbaticals. 
um, you know, in the Western world, they're using the term, you know, furlough, which pretty much means, you know, employees just sit on the bench. Um, they don't get their basic salaries, but, you know, they may still be entitled to some of their benefits. So that's what we're seeing. But what's also interesting is that while some sectors are in demise, there are some new opportunities that are emerging. So, for example, um, the online business, e-commerce. So that has seen an increase in demand for, for workforce. But pretty much the workforce that's required in that sector is not very skilled. Um, so it's pretty much anything anybody can do. So you actually find senior professionals. Some are resorting to work for these online businesses. Um, and then, of course, with that comes the career business, the logistics business. There's opportunities in that space. So people can be self-employed and sign up, you know, to be delivering as people are all sitting at home and um, ordering online. Yeah. So this, this must really also be interesting in terms from a, from a human capital perspective, um, how have they been managing, and I, and I understand you can probably um, probably try to, to, to maybe broaden it a bit. I, from a human capital perspective, just the support of having to tell people that they no longer um, have, you know, the, the terms of employment that they had from the beginning. I think mm -hmm. that's an easy conversation to have in person. I can imagine in times of social distancing and how, how the support from human capital has had to change drastically. And even Absolutely. maybe from a point of um, onboarding, how has, mm. how has the support of human capital um, changed during this pandemic? Yeah, so it, uh, it is now virtual conversations. It is telephone calls and it is, you know, the video face-to-face -face, um, calls. So definitely there is that, there's less of that human um, interaction and you know opportunity to express empathy to show empathy for someone to feel empathy so it does feel rather distant and distant and there is no you can't really put your arms around somebody somebody all somebody has is their family um, to support them through that and um, so you know so those are the challenges that come with that your other question sorry was there was another yes. question. Yeah, it was in terms of on, just onboarding. Onboarding, and, yes. Yeah. Yes. It now has to be virtual onboarding, and it's a different experience. So what that means is, as an organization, you now deliver the tools of trade to new hires, and then you do virtual sessions to onboard. Um, the employee doesn't get that feeling of excitement of walking through the door on day one. Um, but that's just the new reality, and that may be the future reality that prevails. Yeah. So, so Carol, it's interesting that you mentioned that you know certain sectors are also prevailing while others are actually mm -hmm. just bearing the brunt of it all. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if we're looking at the the sector that you just mentioned, that we're seeing a rise in e-commerce. I mean, mm -hmm. that speaks heavily to the conversations to say we're now living in a more digitized um, um, environment, the Internet of Things, etc. But if we're looking at like this, the African environment, not everyone mm -hmm. is on par when we look at other economies when it comes mm -hmm. to, to digital enablement and readiness. Mm -hmm. so, so what impact that does that then have? on the greater population that doesn't have the necessary access mm -hmm. or the infrastructure that has been set up with people, right? So we know that, you know, then they, they're still left behind and they won't be employed because you do need a reliable internet access to be able to, to participate in, in, in these economies or rather in these sectors. So mm -hmm. moving forward, you know, um, conversations around, um, technology as well as internet and digital, where does that leave the majority of, of Africans, you know, in your opinion yeah. and things that you have been experiencing? Yeah. So, you know, as they say, adversity and necessity um, are the catalyst for innovation and creativity. So what I have seen, so what is known, um, and Africa is quite unique in this, is that 
we have a high penetration of mobile in the continent. And that ranges from about 7 to 90%. So that already is a digital communication channel that can be leveraged <clears throat> more. What And we almost don't have a choice and don't have time to get ready. We have now literally been thrown in the deep end in this digital um, era. So you will find, for example, within the education space. So yes, institutions have had to accelerate you know, transitioning to online learning. And it's, it's the process which they are iterating, right, as they're doing it. For those that have less access to internet, you will notice that the national curriculum is available on TV. So yeah. that's a, you know, a method they're trying to use. Obviously it won't reach everybody, but it definitely is a start. And um, what, what you will see as well is the rise of sort of like telemedicine, you know, um, and then this is where you'll find, you know, AI comes in where, you know, people may have their own gadgets, their own Fitbits, and those can connect into their profiles and upload, you know, their, their health profiles. So there are ways and means. Social media as well is on the mm -hmm. rise. So you find a lot more um, happening on social media, you know, whether that's sharing the news as a learning platform, um, and also, you know, as this, I would say this sort of informal commerce as well that's going on social media and then facilitated again by mobile money payments. So uh, that is happening. And interestingly, there is some innovation as well coming through um, some homegrown solutions in various, various countries, again, because of this um, need to reduce the human interface. So you will, you will find that there are some things that can be done by machines or by robot robots. Um, so you will start seeing, I think, more of that. I think Africa has always had the potential. We do have the human capital. And I think this is an opportunity for more support to that talent for us, you know, to develop our own homegrown solutions. Mm. So um, I like the fact that you mentioned that Africa has always had the human capital. And mm. um, in, the earlier, in the earlier question, you said that uh, um, you, you guys have, had, have lost kind of like the human element of being able to onboard someone. But mm -hmm. I think to, in, um, to um, not investigate, but whatever the word is, is in this world that we're moving on and we've been thrown into the world of automation, there's a lot of human skills that we're probably going to be losing, mm. you know, in, in the process. But which mm. one of, the, of those skills are going to be sought after specifically mm. because they don't exist in this new world that we're going to, uh, with, that mm -hmm. we've already been into? Mm -hmm. So the thing is with people now working virtually and mainly from home, um, home is personal space. Mm. So as a leader or as an organization, when you're now interacting with your employees, you now actually have to have that front of mind. It's not a space you can sort of step into and direct, right? You, this is where the humaneness comes in, in that you've got to acknowledge that people are within their social environment, their safe place. So there's an element of respect that you have to give. And there are now new dynamics that are evolving in that home space. So within the home space, people now have to tutor children, right? And they may have a working spouse who also needs to be, you know, on virtual calls. So there's almost now sort of a shared responsibility. So the work day is no longer eight to five. So mm -hmm. as an organization, you know, as employers, employers have to be now flexible um, and understand that, you know, in the morning, maybe, you know, the parent has to actually, um, co you know, facilitate the online learning for the child and then later on. Um, so yeah, so definitely the humaneness comes into it as well. So I think some of the other soft skills I would say, you know, linked to emotional intelligence is everybody, all the stakeholders have to make more of a concerted effort to become connectors, to become relators, right, virtually. Mm -hmm. and you know, it could be both formally and informally. So probably more frequent check-ins, a combination of formal and informal check-ins. Um, you know, teams can have virtual coffees, 
they can have their Friday drinks, um, or they can just have, you know, just a social catch up, or just to find out how everybody's doing. Um, and of course, again, you know, people use sort of even like WhatsApp, so all sorts of uh, ways to connect um, and to really listen and understand um, how somebody is doing. And even the way one would approach business calls, it's not always going to be just hard driving business. You also just got to find out how people are doing and how they're coping. Uh, because I think just the idea of, you know, we're all social beings. Yeah. So having to yeah. now work suddenly without that, um, that socialization as well, you know, puts strain on uh, people's wellness, right? Yeah. Um, from a, a mental perspective. So um, there definitely has to be that increased consciousness. And also I would say linked to that is employees now have to become more self-directed, right? There's no one watching over you. So, yeah. you know, no one's checking you know, whether you're online or not. Um, so definitely people have to become more self-directed. And, um, you know, critical thinkers, because now there's, there's an overload of information and some of it may obviously be biased. So one needs to be able to filter and I always say balance the perspectives. You know, the media will always have its own objectives, but I always say inform yourself and make sure yeah. you get the balanced perspectives. And then of course, again, you know, for leaders, leaders are now leading in a totally different space. Um, when it comes to culture, culture in a place where people were co-located is different to now trying to create a virtual culture. So there are quite a number of um, elements in that. And of course, again, just the agile working. So nothing will be the same. Probably no one day may be the same in your home. So, you know, just that um, agility and just resilience, resilience mm -hmm. through it all. And then one that's not a soft skill, but a necessary skill is just being digitally savvy. We have no choice. Yeah, and I, I, I guess, you know, the, just to, to sum up what you're saying is, you know, in, in this path to try and ensure that you stay relevant, you have the right skills, because now we're operating in a different type of culture. It's no longer just the employee's responsibility, right, mm -hmm. to, to be on point and on brand, so to speak, when it comes to, to skills. But the employer also has to pivot and change mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they, they're managing in completely different times and completely different yeah. spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and being digital, I was reading an article just the other day where they were talking about near Lanseria Airport, they're building what they call a smart city, right? And there's going to be a big focus on digitization within that mm -hmm. environment. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe using that space as ground zero to see how we can further enhance future cities within the country. So yeah. the idea of being digitally savvy is more important mm -hmm. now, right? Moving into mm -hmm. the future. But, yeah. but Carol, maybe if you could just talk, talk us through you know, uh, diversity going forward. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think when we were living pre-COVID times, there were there have always been conversations around BEE and all these policies. You know, to include previously disadvantaged people. And you know, from a South African perspective, without looking in the greater parts of Africa, um, now that we are moving into like a gig economy, digital digitization and if you have access you know then you are most likely going to be employed you know so to speak mm -hmm. within the spaces how does that then impact policies such as bee and affirmative acts um affirmative um is it action mm -hmm. and uh, or oh, employment equity sorry standards right mm -hmm. um because if majority of the population within South Africa is sitting under, you know, is classified as previously disadvantaged and doesn't necessarily have access to, to, the, to the tools as we have today that are allowing us to connect, you know, mm -hmm. how does that impact companies going forward if they still need to adhere to like BE standards? Mm -hmm. mm. So I would think the way I would see it, I don't think there would be too much of a different uh, shift from what prevails. Um, yeah. Because I think there are those, so for the blue collar workers, right, they would still need to go in and work. And for professionals, 
I think it's pretty much um, company practice that you provide the tools of the trade, right? So, um, and what I've even seen now with um, students in universities that um, the, and I'll say, I think it's the Ministry of Higher Education is actually partnering with service providers to provide sort of free internet, um, you know, to allow them study. So I think there'll definitely be more efforts to allow even that talent pipeline, you know, access to tools of trade. Um, but what I would say though is, when it comes to the whole area of diversity, I mean, there is still more work that is required. Um, you know, there are a few pockets of um, good practice, but the conversation is going now almost beyond diversity uh, to inclusion, right? Mm. Uh, because so far, the focus has just been about meet the numbers, you know, tick the box, um, have representation of X percentage, but one, it would be interesting if then one looks at the um, retention, right, and the growth of those resources in the organizations, there's actually a different picture. Um, yeah. If we look back to when the legislation was put in place to where we are now, there really has been no um, significant incremental increase in the number of historically disadvantaged uh, employees in the workplace. Uh, and again, it's because you know what you bring them in on the one end, but you're not you're not really plugging the hole. So that's yeah. where um, we need to come into it. And then in the whole area again of diversity within the South African context, it's the definition or the focus is more on um, on on race, and then um, to another extent gender. So those are the only two elements, and yet diversity is actually very broad. So, you know, there's other elements of orientation, of religion, um, you know, of thought, of age. So one, we need to really broaden that definition of um, diversity. And again, within the workplaces, what workplaces now need to really do, going back to the area of inclusion, is, you know, to create workplaces, regardless of level, where an employee feels excited and mm. come in and free to be able to contribute and be their best, right? Mm -hmm. Then those are the inclusive places um, that the employers of choice, you know, that employees would seek to have. But again, I would, you know, even just taking it a step back, I think people just need to go back to the drawing board and say, what is diversity and why does it matter? Because yeah. I sincerely believe if people understand the why, the value, there's almost no need to legislate it. Right, it would just happen naturally. And I would say that's the ideal sort of end state that we would need to get to. And it's not just South Africa, you know, it's around the world. But it does take a lot of courageous conversations. And we do see in the media, there's a lot of uh, movements that have been sparked on at the moment. Um, and it goes beyond the talk. We just really, as people, people wanna see the proof in the pudding, as they say now, show me the receipts. So I guess maybe going forward, Carol, um, how can we, in this, in, in this environment, and I don't think things are, are never going to be the same again, right? And mm. as young people, we're always trying to find ways in which we can improve ourselves. And already we, there was a large conversation going around on how the skill set is already changing because of the, this, uh, the, the fear of automation and how. Mm. And, and, many of our skills are going to become obsolete. So going forward, how would you advise young people to kind of position ourselves in a space where we don't, we don't feel um, absolute, obsolete and we're still kind of feel relevant in this ever-changing market? Mm -hmm. You know, I would say, I said this before to young people and um, even going forward is like, you need, you know, it's almost like you need to stay woke you know, understand what's happening in the market, what's happening in your sector. Um, you know, so for example, if you're in the legal space, right, how is that evolving? Um, are there other niche areas within the legal space, um, you know, that you could explore, right? So probably, you know, uh, digital law could be another one. Then, you know, with the increase in e-commerce, there could be, you know, that's a growing area. Um, and, I would pretty much say every 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 skill is going to have some sort of 
uh, digitization added to it, whether that be in the form of data and analytics. So I think that's definitely a core that I think everybody needs to, you know, supplement to their existing studies in whatever field you're in. Um, so I would say definitely add to that. And then again, shift. Again, there's no harm in pivoting, um, you know, in terms of what you're studying. You have to be relevant to the future. And unfortunately, some curriculums may not, may be lagging behind what the reality. So I think students really have to take their own initiatives and probably do, you know, there's a lot of free learning um, that you can do online. Because uh, a lot of it is, again, how you understand and how you articulate and how you can apply, you know, to the world of work. Stay woke, explore, and there's that famous saying that says there's always opportunity in chaos. And, Absolutely. you know, it is our responsibility to make sure that we're always looking for that opportunity. Mm -hmm. But just to wrap up the conversation mm -hmm. um, with some of the big points, I guess, that stood out for, for me as you were speaking, Carol, is to say that we, we are now more than ever need to position ourselves uh, as digital gurus, so to speak, make sure yeah. that we stay relevant in this economy because we are not going to go back to what we once knew before COVID. Yeah. Looking at certain industries where we are expecting to see a rise. And so, you know, just saying, you know, are you positioned in, in a way that will give you the leverage to participate in what the future actually looks like? Speaking about inclusion and diversity, you know, I, and it's so right for you to say that when we, whenever we speak, we're always speaking about gender and race. And now, because it's so topical with what's happening globally, right, like racial issues, but then there's a wider spectrum. We're now also celebrating pride, you know, so those people that belong within that group also need to be heard and also need to be considered without fear of uh, being judged or being excluded because of, of who they are. Such a great conversation. And thank you once again um, for joining us on this segment. We really do appreciate it. No, thank you. It's my pleasure. I'm glad I could share some insights. Bye, Carol. Bye, Carol. Okay. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Let us know what, you know, being in a pandem pandemic actually looks like to you in terms of preparing for the future workplace. How are you staying relevant and what are the top skills that you are looking to develop? See you next time.